Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Studio Remote Guitar. Uh, my name is Matt Christensen, and I'll be the host uh, for the next hour or so. And um, today we're going to talk about something uh, very interesting. It's about how user research led to what's now called the GitHub Code Spaces. And um, it's a very interesting journey into user research. And uh, I'm joined by Vix, who's going to tell us all about it today. Hello, Vix. How are you doing? Hi, Mads. Thanks for sitting through that as I yell at my dog to come and join us. <laughs> I, realized I thought that I heard something. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's Oliver. More importantly, he will be joining us for the interview, uh, too. He's got a little corner, his own little corner there. Yeah. Nice. Hi. It's so good to hear. I'm Vix. Um, I use they, them pronouns, and I work on Code Spaces and Visual Studio. Nice. So just sort of to kick things off, uh, and maybe not everyone knows what a code space is or what GitHub code spaces are. Could you just give a little bit of an introduction to what is that thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question. Code spaces, there's a lot that code spaces are capable of um, and a lot that it encompasses. But I'll start off by saying that it's a cloud powered development environment um, that works with what you need in your environments and your setup. So we have several offerings with GitHub Code Spaces in which you can use it with VS Code or Visual Studio or even from the browser um, to be able to develop your applications and have the power that you need to build, run, complete inner loop tasks, um, but have that be in the cloud instead of on your machine. So that's a brief overview. And then it's it, can be really expansive from there because it takes everything that you can with with the environment that you have right now, but allowing it to have um, expanding it with that power of the cloud. So, um, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to talk more about the details. But at a high level, that's Code Spaces. It's really um, we found helpful with talking with customers about ways in which that they can share their environments and their setups. Um, in a way where it doesn't take a day or two or a week even to get all of those environments set up each time that they need somebody to um, start developing quickly on their code. Um, so easily adding that into your repository and then just quickly getting up and running in an environment that feels the same to you, very similar to the way that you use Visual Studio and our products today. Okay, that was a great explanation. And uh, you have, I think, uh, very recently, you went to talk to Leslie Richardson on the Visual Studio Toolbox show, and yeah. you and you showed off code space and all that sort of stuff. So, if if the audience out there, if you want to learn more about like what does it look like, how does it, uh, how, yeah, then go check out the Visual Studio Toolbox show on Channel Nine or on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Okay, so code spaces it's kind of a big deal uh and it's I, I find it very fascinating in that it's it's a it's a way to scale my machine up to the cloud to to it to infinity and beyond right <laughs> it, uh, it has sort of that it's almost like it's it's unlocking like potential we can't even think about yet and i'm just and so i was curious because you and i we were talking and um and we knew we wanted to do something on code spaces but i thought it would be a very interesting thing to talk about the use of research specifically about code, search, uh, code spaces, because that's kind of an, a behind the camera type of topic that we don't really talk about that much, uh, how we do user research and uh, and how it actually leads to the features we see. And so it's about like getting signal from customers following following their path and their lead and, and uncovering some problems and potential solutions along the way, right? And um, and it's a, it's a very complicated and fascinating uh, thing to, to be engaged in. And that's kind of what you do. Is that right? Yeah, I would say that's a big part about what I do. It's a big part about what I find um, engaging and exciting about um, being a PM in Visual Studio and Code Spaces is that I get to sit with customers and ask them what they're, what they're thinking, how they're feeling, how it would work for them, ask them really like, probe in on specific ways and scenarios in which they could see this working. Um, we've been running, I don't even know how many hours like of testing um, throughout this whole process. And then even more recently, we've been having these um, 
studies where we ask customers now that we're in our, our private preview to bring their own repository and we sit with them for even just an hour and a half going through things that they would normally solve and work on and work through, um, but in a code space, seeing what's coming up for them, what points are confusing for them, what points are exciting for them. Um, and that's like the most recent research. So that was, uh, I don't even know how many hours the past like few weeks. And then we have another week coming up um, on Thursday. So it's it's been, it, it's been many hours of videos and reviews, and then also a lot of talking directly with customers. Um, one thing that I really enjoy doing is like sitting with them in parts that are frustrating for them, you know, where they're like, I, I had this really, this really interesting thing happen where the, a process was hanging in, in, in the early kind of version of, of code space and they were waiting for it to complete this, this loading. And, um, I believe initializing the code space and they were confused because they were like, I, I'm not sure if it's done or what's happening. So they opened up their task manager to, to check it out, you know, and um, the that that would be hard because all of the processing is in the cloud. So it looked like it wasn't moving. So things like that where we were like, oh, my gosh, I wouldn't have figured that out without them there, you know. And so even talking with them about like, what was your thought process behind that? Like, how do your motions that you do every day uh, change and shift or don't change when you're now in a cloud environment, when you're now connected to a code space? How does that feel different for you? Um, where do you notice that? So moments like that, I really, I really get excited about watching them, talking with them about it, um, and investigating more about ways that we can make it clearer and um, and maybe more, even more useful for them to know. Mm -hmm where those boundaries are. Um, and then there are ways that we've seen that go really, really well, like in their onboarding experience and creating a new code space. Folks are so, so like, that's been nice. <laughs> what was really interesting about what you just said with the, so that user, because they're used to just open the task manager to see what's going on. Am I spiking CPU or something? Totally. And, and the fact that they didn't even realize that, hey, you know, I'm working in a, on an environment that's hosted in the cloud, I'm using Visual Studio local on my machine, but it's just connected. It doesn't do, Visual Studio doesn't do anything in that case. The cloud is doing everything. But the fact that they didn't even realize that because it was all, it all felt kind of very similar to what they normally do. That's kind of cool, right? That tells you that, I'm guessing, it tells me that, that it feels like a normal situation for them, even though it's a very different under the hood. Absolutely, I think that's a great, Point and what and something that we talked about more with that customer of and something that I have direct quotes like running in my head from it where it's mm -hmm. like I like how this feels just like how VS feels for me I think I like how it it has the same type of um, yeah I don't know like textures it feels familiar it feels like nice and comfortable um, and so it's cool to find that balance between like what feels like nice and comfortable and familiar and also what what is different about it or, or how how that comes through as well. Mm -hmm. So if we rewind time to a to a time before we even started with uh, with code spaces um, and I was involved in code spaces for a while as well. Mm -hmm. uh, some sometime in the past, but it started even earlier than than I was involved as well. So. Uh, I remember it started with being there was so so someone within the Visual Studio family of products in that team um, in developer division is what we call it um, wanted to figure out if there was some way that um, you know the cloud could help power the inner loop of a developer. Is there any way that we can leverage the fact that we have a cloud that could benefit? Uh, Visual Studio users, and so a lot of sort of probing and and interviews and stuff happened with with customers, and um, and then we pick up as these signals, and so that's kind of an interesting thing to talk about, right? Because you know, typically when we talk about user research, or my understanding, and I'm I'm not, my understanding is not that great, uh, is is that you you come up with a set of assumptions that you want validated or invalidated, 
But sometimes those users take you into tangents and start talking about other things and you pick up on these signals. And once you've done enough of these customer interviews or surveys or whatever, you start picking up on these signals and see, oh, there's some trends here and there. And, and then you follow them. And it, is that kind of how the journey has been for coach bases? Because in the beginning, I feel like it wasn't, it wasn't as clearly defined as yeah. it is today. And so how, how do you go from like picking up on signals to like come to like a fully clearly defined user scenario and, and, and take it from there basically? Yeah, I mean, great questions. And that is super accurate about how it kind of comes together. You know, in the, in, in post, it seems really simple sometimes like, oh, we found this need and we filled it with this service, this is, you know, amazing offering. And now that's all just copacetic during the actual um, findings and, and early analysis. It's so much more disorganized and um, creative feeling than that, I think, where we have a list of hypotheses of problems that we think developers are facing and we talk with them. Some of them feel so obvious. And then we get into an interview and they, it doesn't resonate at all. <laughs> um, it's actually a completely different problem. And so we go back to the drawing board and we try again and we set up new hypothesis. Um, one of the things that I like a lot about our customer interview process is that we try really hard not to bias customers toward what our assumptions are. So one of the things, and it's something that I take really seriously, um, we actually start a lot of our customer interviews with saying like, please don't be kind <laughs> necessarily, like please just be really honest. And if something isn't working for you, that's, that is not upsetting over here. You know, like uh, it's absolutely fine to say that this doesn't work for you at all. Um, and we tend to get pretty honest responses from customers. So there were times where we would say that, mm, Maybe we had a problem around an, an, a hypothesis of a problem around collaboration. And this was post COVID <laughs> before everybody started to realize that, yeah, we, we definitely need better collaboration. Um, and we were talking with, you know, folks who worked remotely and seeing, okay, what kind of problems could we solve to bring it closer than maybe like a screen share um, type software of seeing, okay, how can we collaborate together? So the problems that we saw there has led to live share. Um, some of the problems that we see around folks um, onboarding quickly into a code base that they're not familiar with, maybe the syntaxing, um, maybe the variables or functions, then we have IntelliCode. But it took so much time of saying like, is this the problem? Is this solving it? And we're continually investigating that as we go along. So each time we build something, it's like two steps forward and building it one step back to verify, two steps forward to building and one step back to verify. Um, so those interviews are, are just part of the job and ongoing throughout anything that we're building is making sure that it's still providing value. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> so when you, Go on, and you said you have a you have a hypothesis that you want to in, to validate or invalidate. And I assume, like here, having having an assumption or a hypothesis about a, a problem that um, users might have, whether you validate or invalidate, it's not like you're sad if it's one versus the other, right? It's like you just need to get to the truth and figure out what are the real problems, so you know what the problem space is. And yeah. sometimes, and then you mention also that then you modify, you learn something new, there are new signals and you modify your, your hypothesis and then you ask different questions. So does that mean that when you start a round of interviews, the first person you're talking to has a different set of questions than the last person because you modify the questions along the way to better reflect sort of reality or how, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. Sometimes it works like that. Um, especially with when we are showing concepts too, that gets a little bit trickier, but there are definitely parts where when we start to see a trend, even just in a few interviews, 
of folks saying like that, it, it doesn't necessarily cause us to change the questions because we do wanna have consistency to establish trends, but it allows me to, to ask for more understanding about ones that tend to come up as a particular, um, the way that I think about it is it, it brings out an emotion in the customer. You know, it brings out like um, a level of frustration or it brings out um, like when folks are talking about onboarding a new team member, a lot of people have frustration that comes up around that, you know, getting in their dependencies, setting up their documentation, keeping their documentation accurate, having that all separate from their repository or where the rest of their code context is. Um, lots of feeling of frustration and sometimes angst in that. Hmm. So if I'm asking about a set of problem hypotheses that go from maybe there's onboarding, maybe there's like initial debugging um, on the, you know, understanding of debugging tools. And maybe there's something very different like collaboration. And as we're going through the interviews in the first two, I noticed that the onboarding is getting this like red <laughs> signal of, okay, this is really, really frustrating, which I've been that this is based on a true story. Um, and it starts coming up for them. Then I ask more and more questions around, okay, what was the time that this happened? recently how did it go what how often do you have to do this to understand not just not just the way that they're feeling about it but also how much does that impact their work which are two which is what we use to ca calculate an opportunity gap so we have the intensity of the of the emotion or the problem and then the frequency in which they experience the problem. When those two are high, we know that we have an area that could we could potentially offer a really good solution. Yeah. Um, so when I was involved in code spaces, was actually the time when we started looking into the whole onboarding thing. And I remember just just to add to what you're saying, like with a concrete example. Um, you know, what is the hard time? We've all been there. We start a new job at some point, and you have to onboard. You have to set up your environment. You have to install your all the different programs, Visual Studio, you know, whatnot. You have to get permissions, and there's so many different things involved in this. And so we were starting to probe and ask, like, what is the actual problem? Like, we want to get deeper into what is the problem specifically with onboarding, like very, very specifically. And uh, and and a thing that came out was um, that who 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 do you think is it hard to onboard for? Is it hard for is it hard for the new person on a team? Is it hard for their manager, or is it hard for their colleagues? Right? Mm -hmm. it, we didn't even know to ask those questions, but that came out of it. And at by the end of the interview round, we had we had separated those out because it turns out that uh, there was a part that was. I think the ones that had a hardest time with onboarding was actually the colleagues of the new hire that had to sit there and help and set up environments and all this. It was not the new hire themselves necessarily. Yeah. Who would have thunk? Yeah. Right. I, Wild. <laughs> me, it was, I didn't know at least. Um, yeah. I didn't know that either. I, I spent a lot of time interviewing um, new customers and it's really interesting to see the, the ways in which we all work in this kind of spider web of of connections that we that we work in teams, whether or not um, it's just with like one or two individuals, or maybe the person we're working directly for, or it's a large team like developer division, right? Where all these interconnected dependencies, and so when we learn about what one person's frustration is, it's not just their frustration, it's the way that it applies to everything else. And it also is a way that it applies to, to themselves, like the way that they feel accomplished as a developer, the way that they feel like they can go and solve problems with our tooling. Hmm. And that's something that I find really, really important in the work that we do is making sure that we are contributing to that success of, of their daily successes. And that when those frustration comes up, I feel really empathetic toward it because it's not about 
me or the area of the tooling that I'm building. It's about the fact that they just want to be able to do their job well and effectively. And if they're hitting issues, it, it makes that really sad for them, you know, like that's, that, that sucks, you know? And so um, I don't take it personally when I, I, I find those things or when I hear about those things in an area that I'm managing because it, I feel grateful that they would tell me so that I can go and work on it um, and understanding that, you know, I feel frustrated sometimes too in a lot of areas of tech. <laughs> it's yeah. like I see something and I'm like, I want to fix that <laughs> all the time. It's like, it's like all their feedback, positive and negative is like a little, it's a little present. They hand yeah. to us and we're, we're very happy about it. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, but I like what you said about like, you know, Visual Studio's success is hinging on the user's success in achieving their goals and 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 writing their apps in the most uh, efficient way and so on. Yeah. Um, that that's that's cool and that's actually key to Visual Studio. That is that is how we look at it. Like Visual Studio cannot be successful without our users being successful, and so everything revolves around that. Yeah. Um, and so. So cu the customer research that then led to code spaces, like we got all these signals and you kind of, and then you followed it. Mm -hmm. And that was basically just listening to what the users had to say and feeling their pain basically about certain things and understanding where they came from. And, and then was, was code spaces what it is now? Or wh what was the sort of the evolution of code spaces itself? Like, or some of the features of code spaces based yeah. on that feedback? Absolutely. Yeah, we started with a, Good question. We started with an, an initial set of experiences with code spaces. We found that some of the initial um, UX and the way that they are, the way that they were setting up those like very early versions of code spaces caused a lot of confusion for customers, right? So we, we knew that we had a bit of a problem and the thing, that is so interesting and cool about code spaces is that we're taking something that previously has been done in the cloud, you know, with like with um, Azure portal and all these VM settings and, you know, starting with this kind of clean box feel and having to reestablish that. And then maybe you um, terminate that VM and you have to start all over. And that, you know, takes a lot of provisioning and time and removing that from the customer's um, to-do list and, and code spaces kind of taking that and saying like, we'll go do all the to-dos, all the arguably boring to-dos, and we'll just give you your environment to get going and started with. There were some learnings, some very distinct learnings that we had in taking that, the complexity of the cloud and the way that customers relate to the cloud and trying to move it into something that's really clear and concise and easy. And is also not necessarily focused on the cloud being the resource, but your repository, the place that your code lives being the resource and the main focus. Um, so whether that be, you know, adding in customizations that live in your repository with a devinit.json file, that then you can just reuse each time that you have a code space. Um, you start your code space and it runs a post create command that installs a SQL that you need to get going with quickly. Um, so there, there are thoughts like that, you know, and in that initial kind of learning, we had this, this hard time bringing in all of the cloud into a clean, concise UI. So we went through many iterations with customers and in interviews, asking them what information is the most important to you? What do you care about at this stage? And what do you not feel worried about that you trust us? And there's a big element of trust here um, throughout the code space experience of saying, okay, can we, can we take care of that for you? Do you feel comfortable with that? And then, and then you just get to go straight into your dev environment. So it's finding that balance because as developers, we're extremely creative of finding, trying to, um, and peel back the layers of that onion and see what's going on underneath um, and investigating that. So it's been interesting finding a balance in uh, information that we that we give upfront. And we ended up 
having, I think, and from what we've heard from customers, a really clean getting started experience to where they can just put in their repository, click, uh, decide what kind of power they want for their environment and decide when that environment um, suspends or goes into idle so that they don't have to continue to, to use up resources. And then they just get started and it just goes. Um, so that's, that's where we ended up, but it took a lot of talking with customers and, and investigating clearly to see whether or not that's what they wanted. Um, but we've been hearing some really positive um, feedback that it, from them in the most recent interviews saying that it, um, yeah, it feels familiar and easy and nice um, to get started, which is flattering because that's the area that I work on. Um, so that's been really nice. But I would also encourage folks walk, uh, watching to, to give it a go. We're onboarding people into the private preview, you know, as we speak. Um, feel free to, to tweet me if it doesn't feel that way to you. That's awesome. Uh, so how do you then know that you're done? So you're saying you went through many iterations and now it's like a really good experience. And I will agree. I remember the, the, the beginning of it, how it was much more complex than it is now. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you know like that you're, are you then done? How, or is it something that you keep, keep going at or how does that work? Yeah. Um, I don't feel like there is a, state of done i would i think that there are states where it's it's reached a level of effectiveness that works really well for most people and even then i still want to investigate what more could be done to make it even better um i think right now you know we're we have these initial rounds and then we're also going to have a reunion round of folks who came through the first um, sets and seeing how, you know, how they feel now, like a few weeks later of trying code spaces. Um, I think that, like I said before, the investigating of continually how we make it better is a huge part that at least I feel really engaged with in the team. And I feel that through, we have so many different channels to receive feedback whether it's Twitter, developer community, and feedback items, suggestions, um, through email, through like our onboarding process. Um, so I feel that we will continue to improve it. And I feel that in, instead of being done, it's just the improvements will get maybe smaller or more specific. Um, but there are some things I'm already thinking about that I'd really like to add to um, and optimize even in the onboarding experience today so far. So anything you can tell us about? Um, yeah, I think so. I think I, one thing that we've been hearing a lot from customers is the way that we interact with repositories and, and having that, um, maybe be an even more interactive experience than just pasting in your URL, maybe be able to have more understanding of of where your branches are and how you pick them and, mm -hmm. and how that um, applies to the environments and code spaces that you set up. Uh, so that's something that I've been thinking about. Getting back into your code space and your context easily is also something that I'm working on and thinking a lot about. Um, so stay tuned for, nice. for hopefully some cool updates there. All right, Bert, people, you heard that here first. <laughs> Some potential future goodies coming. So we got a question here, Vix. Yeah. I just two stuff. He asks, so I'm still on VS. Is there anything wrong with it? If not, um, why code spaces? And it's the first time he hears about code spaces from, th from this conversation mm -hmm. we're having here. So is there anything wrong with just VS? No, there's nothing wrong with VS. That's a great question. Um, VS is an incredibly powerful tool set that has a lot to offer, as you may know, being here. Um, Code Spaces is an offering that can really help in, in specific scenarios. So if you have, um, and in day-to-day -day development as well, there are some that we've been hearing a lot from customers, like 
since going remote with COVID, I am on my old laptop. I have limited processing power. I don't have access to the machines that I did before. And I'm finding it really hard to stay productive um, with how, how my machine is limiting me. Uh, with creating a code space, you don't have to worry about that. It's all in the cloud. You can just go ahead and get started. And it feels like you would with VS. Um, so that's one that I think about. Another one is, is kind of what I talked about before with onboarding folks into your code spaces environments. So being able to just clone your repository and have a code space set up with your dependencies so much faster than getting a VM set up from scratch or mm -hmm. um, trying to share every all that context via even via live share, um, which can be incredibly powerful too. It's just about what your needs are in that particular moment. So we've heard that that kind of reusable, quick environment setup um, has taken folks from days of setup time, or at least a day, and hours to minutes. Um, so that's been something really big that we've been hearing from customers. And then I would say um, that there was one more, and I'm blanking on it, but there was another thing that I was thinking about too. It's okay. It might come back to me. Nothing Did you have the performance on there? What was that? The performance? Did you already talk about that? Uh, the performance. No. Like if you don't have a powerful machine home in your home office or whatever, you can harness the immense cloud power that's available out there. And so you can, you can kind of feel like you have this. It feels like you have a huge machine, but you just have a little laptop maybe. A little yeah. old laptop. Absolutely. Yeah. Performance is a big aspect of it. And I think that... Oh, I was, I remember now when you are working on so many different types of projects, let's say that you are working on several different types of apps. And sometimes it's hard to keep track of all of those on your machine and switching context um, with the dependencies that you need to keep aligned to, especially if you're kind of working in um, sometimes what I'll be working in is like Outside of work, I do a lot of um, development work for like nonprofits and grassroots organizations. Sometimes the the let's say I'm doing some web development for them in one and it goes for a while and then it stops and they don't need anything for a while. This one starts going for a while that stops and this one comes back up. And each time it feels like I am out of sync a little bit. You know, I have to like reestablish that context and kind of start all over. Um, when that's already set up in my repository and kind of ready to go, all I'd have to do is just clone from code spaces and have my environment set up and get back into developing, even when I've maybe had to do a, like a full reset on my laptop or I've switched all of my variables already testing something for work. So that's that helps me kind of keep things clean and in a place that feels a little bit easier which allows me then to just get working on it rather than being bogged down by setup because setup for me is really boring and not fun at all. Um, so yeah. I tend to put it off <laughs> for a while. So one thing I think the way that you've kind of implemented code spaces into the regular Visual Studio experience, I think is like pretty awesome. And it, it didn't start out like that. It, it became that. And it feels today that it's just kind of a feature. So again, just to to uh, to Seth's question here, um, I feel that it's, it's, you probably don't use every single feature of Visual Studio today. Mm. And so one way I think about it is that it's, that code space is just adds, it's just another feature you can take advantage of if you want to, if you feel that that's beneficial to you. Mm. And you can just go ahead and do that from within Visual Studio. So it's like all your local development that you have today is continuing to do, to work and do the exact same thing. And you can then opt in to this, to this um, code spaces that is just kind of a feature you opt into like like other features, uh, though it's fundamentally different, right? Because it's actually, uh, it required a lot of re-architecture from, from all areas of Visual Studio to be able to connect remotely instead of everything being local in the same process. Yeah. And I so that, that brings us to question, another question here, Vix. I was wondering if we can have a self-hosted version of code spaces. Mm, that's a great question. It is something that we've thought about and it's something that we've explored. I am not sure exactly where it's at right now um, about whether or not we'll continue to offer that or whether or not you could do that right today. 
Um, it's an excellent question and I'd love to tweet at you with an answer um, later with a little bit more investigation. Mads, not sure if you if you have an answer for that too. Well, I think the last I heard of it was that, because it's something that comes up, right? Yeah. Obviously. Um, and I think it's like we need to land the, the GitHub code spaces experience first and then we can then we can look at it. Uh, okay. So I think it's it's not a decision either either way. It's just we need to get the initial experience uh, done first. Yeah, I think that's a good way of looking at it. As in it's something that I, we want to, yeah, learn more about what type of value that would provide, how that would fit into the kind of story of code spaces. Um, it's again, finding that balance between like everything that the cloud has to offer, your environment that you're familiar and comfortable in, and how do we find a good balance between both of these things, you know? And so I think that this question comes up for me in that of like, okay, cool. Like, would that, would that still provide the value? Um, would it be additive? Would that feel like a, something big and new? Um, and I think that those are questions that we still need to investigate more and have yep. more more research into as well. Right. Yeah. And then here's uh, the last follow up here. When can we expect Code Spaces GA? I'm not sure, we have a date yet. Do we? Do we? I don't think we have a date yet. Yeah. Um, it, it's one of those things where we maybe we don't even know when we're ready, and so we're still like working on it. And uh, yeah. is that how it is? Yeah, I think. Um, I think the hope is that we have it, um, you know, in the next year. I, I, I'm hoping that 2021 is like a great year for for code spaces and and that we can offer it to many more folks. Um, I think that understanding that like this is a is a time where we're really trying to to provide as much as we can while still understanding that that we're all going through a lot with this, um, with COVID and with this pandemic. So as we go through creating great experiences for you all, we want to make sure that they they really have the time and care um, needed to, to feel stable and nice and clean. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like to what you said, Mads, it's like we, we will know when we get there. Um, and until then we, are really appreciating all of the feedback that's coming through the private preview. I can't stress that enough. Like folks who are trying it, giving it a go, you know, it's free to try in the private preview. You can just like see how it goes. Um, but yeah, we will know when we get there and, and we are doing a lot of research in the meantime to see how it's going and um, how we can continue to improve it. All right. So we don't know yet is the answer, I guess. No, no, yet. Yeah. yeah. I don't have a date for you. But actually there's a there's a part of that answer that I really like, and that is that, mm -hmm. you know, in software sometimes deadlines drive what we're building. So you know the, the triangle of what is it like you can have quality, yeah. you can have scope, and you can have what is the time? Time, yeah. And so it, but you can only have two of them. You can't have all three. And so mm -hmm. if time is fixed, you can either choose between scope, like the number of features, or quality. You can't have both. So yes. when you have to work back from like a deadline date, you choose, do you want quality? Then you get a smaller, like an MVP type of thing or, or minimal lovable product maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but you won't get a lot of features. And I think with with uh, with code spaces, what was interesting was that it was a very development driven, like by our engineering teams, mm -hmm. effort in figuring out can we do it? What what would it look like? And then the customer research, okay, what is it that people then want from a detailed perspective? Marrying it all up kind of and and out the other end came this iterative process of continuous improvement and refinement and all this sort of stuff, but without a deadline in mind. Complete mm -hmm. exploratory, yeah. concentrating on getting it right instead of instead of working backwards from a from a release date. So it's almost like the scope and the quality are the ones that are fixed, whereas the time is like, it, it, maybe it doesn't matter as much, right. which is so rare. Yeah, that is rare and um, exciting. I think it's like mm -hmm. a very cool place to be in. I've spent a lot of time working back from deadlines in developing different features and areas of scope. So it's, um, it's we definitely have a sense of 
of wanting to get this out to you all. Like there's definitely that excitement of wanting to provide it. And I feel like that's where some of the time comes in of saying like, okay, how can we get it to a place where it feels, you know, where it continues to feel like a good quality experience where it has the scope enough so that you can be productive and efficient. Um, and then also, yeah, that time, you know, just also trying to be gentle with ourselves during this time of like, it will take some time to understand that. And this is something that feels really new in a time that's really new. And so we're just going to see how it goes and try to do our best and really focus in on that quality. Um, so it's been, it's been a challenge to scope and have that quality as well. Um, but a fun challenge at that, I think, yeah. and very, very cool learning experience um, in, in breaking out of comfort zones of different features and, and finding new ways, new creative ways to solve problems. Um, that's an everyday occurrence on the team. So really appreciate the engineering team I work with and um, the other PMs doing research too. It's just wonderful. I love it. And, uh, and, I think an interesting aspect is is the so many many parts of Visual Studio had to be changed and modified, sort of under the hood, to allow for code spaces to exist. Yeah. Which meant that some features had to be rewritten from scratch, but a lot mm -hmm. of them just had to be kind of modified under the hood, the way they kind of worked their internals and so on. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned this, like, were there a lot of like reimagination of existing features that had to be rewritten anyway that came about from this like what are sort of the side effects that came mm -hmm. from this if, if if any i don't know if how, how isolated coach bases were because it's a it's a very broad effort with multiple teams yeah and a great question i think um i have a lot of insight into that from the team that i sit on directly where in the ID experience team and, and the shell team. And so we touch so much of the product from, from where we're sitting um, as a team. And it, it definitely, there are definitely things that have been uh, where we've discovered that we need to have rewrites. There are definitely things that feel like um, just minor tweaks, um, like our start window experience is that's that's relatively new um, in Visual Studio 2019. And so a lot of the things that we needed to bring code spaces into that experience, um, yeah, it felt really uh, understood and achievable um, in the UI, in the dialogues. And then there are other things like, you know, Solution Explorer that has a lot, a lot of context, years, years and years of context. Um, and, and pulling apart those layers to make room for code spaces and its functionality, to think about it as this client connecting to our service and the cloud and through these APIs, it's, it's different. It feels different when we're in the room discussing, in, in the room, discussing and talking about strategizing how to create that same, that familiar feel of Visual Studio inside a code space, because there are things that we had to, and we continue to take apart, kind of re reimagine and then put back together to feel similar. Um, and then there are other things where it feels pretty natural too. Um, like we have roaming settings. So building off of the way that we roam and understand uh, via your identity with Visual Studio, you know, we can reuse some of that previous learning inside the context of code spaces. Similarly to like the new Git tooling experiences. Um, great experiences. I would highly recommend to go check those out if you haven't already. Um, love the improvements in, in that. Um, Tacey and Pratik did a wonderful job uh, investigating that along with Veronica. So the Git tooling you know, this is a, these like more recent optimizations and, you know, having GitHub code spaces and applying this, we're seeing a lot of learning and kind of cross collaboration between teams in that. So some things have been reimagined, some things have been built on in an, an existing way, and some things have to um, just evolve, you know, and in something to be different. I think there are some 
areas of the product where we will have to do maybe a larger type of rewrite um, eventually. And so we're thinking about scope. We're thinking about how much customers need, um, what features they need in a code space versus what features are nice to have. Um, because, you know, taking 20 years of context and, and or reimagining it in a cloud context is no small task. So um, all that feedback has been really valuable and we're finding new things every day. Yeah. So, so you mentioned the new Git experience. And so that's a separate team. You said you're on the shell team, the Visual Studio shell yeah. team. Yeah. And so we have the Visual Studio version control team as well. And they're, they're in charge of, of that area. Mm -hmm. and they're doing customer research, you're doing customer research. Mm -hmm. Like, are there any overlaps and how do you how do you involve all those different teams when you're talking about something that is so t crossing teams like, um, like Code Spaces is it touches all teams basically. Yeah. So how do you reconcile all those different signals and all the different information that comes in to, directly to the other teams to come up with a big coherent story? Yeah. Ooh. What a challenge. Um, <laughs> we, we talk a lot between the teams. Um, sometimes it's as simple as like sending each other our PowerPoint decks or our, our, our design files before research starts, you know, and saying, Pratik and I will send messages back and forth of like, how does this look to you? Does this make sense? Can you apply this to your area? What, what came out of your, your discussions with customers? Um, and other times it's we have like our larger group meeting too, where we'll give demos and present our findings. Um, each week we have a, a, what we call a cloud pulse meeting and I'll present there too, saying like, this is what I've been hearing. This is what I've been finding. This is what folks feel like are really impactful bugs. Uh, and we have discussions with not just PMs, but engineers across many different uh, areas of VS. And what they can do is they can bring up things to me too of saying, can you please poke in on this more when you talk with them? Can you ask them about this or how did they respond to this? Um, so there's this aspect of, of being the voice, communicating what customers, not necessarily being their voice, but uh, trick translating or giving space for their voice when we get into really detailed engineering discussions as well. Um, I like to think that I help bring that to the table and what we do as like in, in our discussions across PM and engineering is that we'll say, this is what I've been hearing. This is as unbiased as I could possibly make it. What do we think we want to do with this information? Um, and so it's, it's kind of my job and, and other PM's job too, to, to really understand what the impact is of what customers are sharing. Um, but we have discussions across cross version control, across language service, across project systems, across um, some debugging and diagnostics, and we all collaborate and share that information. Um, lastly, we'll, what I'll do is I'll also send out this report to an alias that has like 500 people on it, which is like wild around what, what the customer development notes were from the studies that I've been running and give overviews of pain points, specific bugs, um, excitement and where things are, are going really well. And it's amazing the responses that I get back from the team, from all over the team, you know, areas of documentation or um, areas from one of the, you know, teams that I mentioned already, areas from uh, the VS Code team and what they're doing with Code Spaces. We talk a lot with our partners on the other clients too. So the browser experience and the VS Code experience for uh, GitHub Code Spaces. So it's, it's a lot of time collaborating um, because it's not very useful if I receive all this information and feedback from customers and just keep it to myself. So we do a lot of, of discussions and sharing back and forth. Yeah, it sounds like a, it's a it's a big puzzle, mm. almost like multiple different puzzles and fitting into one big puzzle and and making it all go up at the end. Yeah, it's a it's a fun exercise when it when it, when you succeed, right? Yeah, <laughs> it is. So maybe this is. 
we've not done this before, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it out there saying, if this sounds interesting to you, we're hiring <laughs> careers at Microsoft.com work on code spaces, engineer, PM, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, go check it out. Um, it's really, it's a fascinating place. And, and as Vix is explaining here, there's, we're doing some really cool stuff and, um, yeah. So let's yeah. do that. And we got time for a few other questions. Cool. Um, let's see here. Um, I don't know if we can, if we can answer this one. Will code spaces be under licensing model or anybody can use it? So under licensing, do you mean you, you can host it yourself or that you can connect to it from, not from Visual Studio, but from your own uh, editor ID of choice? Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what you mean, but do we, do we have any information about this at this point? I, I don't think that we have some clear information about this. I think that we, I think that this is a great question for our subscriptions team to to get back to you on or to be able to give more context on. I think that the 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 depth that they know about licensing models impresses me <laughs> a lot. Um, but I wouldn't say that I'm an expert on it. And I do think that there, even if I were, there's still a lot of things that we're figuring out. I think mm -hmm. we're trying to understand what areas are the most effective and what areas we feel like are missing today. Um, and I think that the licensing models, the payment structures, um, I think it's important to note that, you know, we will be, you know, this is also part of a GitHub context and world. Um, so I imagine that there will be some, some understanding of how, we have that with, with GitHub and that partnership, which has been really cool to work with them and, and closely with the GitHub team on. Um, even just like sharing research, they come to our sessions, we go to theirs, um, which has been really fun. Um, but yeah, I think I think that we will have to get back to you on that. I don't know if we, if we have it figured out yet, but I think the subscription folks will probably be able to give the best best answer to it. Yeah. That's a, that's a good answer. And I think Amanda, who's our uh, vice president, she's the boss of everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I think she's, and I'm totally butchering her, her the way she says it. I'm sorry, Amanda, but something <laughs> like build something that adds tremendous customer value and then worry about licensing and monetization later on. The most yeah. important thing is, is to basically build what people need and want. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. that, I mean, even just from our, like my, way back my like first week joining DevDiv, that was very clear of, of saying that we are trying to build experiences that feel engaging and helpful and clear and concise and efficient to customers. And that's our number one priority is working on making sure that they're engaging and, and helpful. And then we can figure out how we monetize once we figure out what's providing value. Um, but I, it never feels like for me that that's the, that that's the focus. I don't even think about it when I'm developing features. Um, we just think about providing value. So that feels really cool. <laughs> it's definitely a newer experience. Yeah. It's, it's nice not to be always considering like business strategies and all sorts of just focus hundred percent on the best possible user experience. Yeah. Exactly. That's a good thing about our team. I don't know. Like I've never had a job before where that was uh, to the same extent that is, as it is here. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I haven't had that either. So it's been a really cool experience to, to just, yeah. re I don't know, relax into that really. It helps, it helps bring, um, you can see how it's all interconnected, right? Like the way that we can really investigate unbiased answers to what customers are saying, that affects how we complete our timelines. That affects how we monetize. Like all of those are connected. So if we were had a big focus on monetizing, a big focus on hitting a deadline, it would not feel as comfortable in those interviews to say like, really, whatever you say is fine. Hmm. If we need to go back to the drawing board, we will. Um, but we have the freedom to do that with the, with the structure of the team. Um, so I think that's been really cool. Yeah. Anyways. That's, that's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're almost at the end here. Um, I have one last question for you. Mm -hmm. So in all this customer research you did, 
whether it's code spaces or not. What was sort of the biggest surprise finding that you've had or what led to sort of the most interesting outcome that you remember, mm -hmm. if you can remember any of this? That's it's a tough question. It is a tough question. I think one of the bigger surprises, I won't say the biggest because I feel like that's such an interesting question and I'll probably think of an incredible example right after we end. <laughs> I feel that a big surprise for me was how, and I've talked about this some during this interview, but how much it feels natural for them to develop inside the code space. I was worried because I am privy to how much how much we have to do to make it look look and feel and function like a local VS. Um, it's almost like when you have like a play or you're putting on a production and you notice if you're like a stagehand, you notice like every every type of like not perfectly sanded edge, every type of like, paint that's missing from a corner or something like that. And then when somebody sees the show, they're like, it was incredible. I felt like I was there. It was magical. Um, that's, that this ha has been a surprise for me. Um, I think I was expecting folks to be like, this, this feels off. This, I don't like this. And it really hasn't been like that. Um, which it would be okay if it were, but it's been a big surprise that it hasn't, um, and that folks have been, I think, presently, pleasantly surprised as well. Um, but it is interesting to know all the deeper layers and the, the mechanics underneath and then see their reaction of like, oh, it just works. Okay, cool. <laughs> it just works. I'm just gonna debug and build and run and it's fine. And yeah. um, so that's been surprising, happily surprising for me. <laughs> So that you know that's really great. So so people should just go and sign up for the private preview. See if they can get into the private preview. Yeah. And they you know um, so go ahead try try that out, and uh, and hopefully you'll have that great experience that Vix was talking about. That's fantastic. Yeah, I would love to put a link into it as well um, for okay. for signing up. But um, oh, you got a link there? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay. You know, I can just post that. So let's just post that. I'm just going to post that in the comments right there so people can click it. And then I'm going to put it in a banner on the video itself. Sweet. There it is. Yeah. So that's, a, that's, a long, that's a long one. Sorry, sorry, folks. Long. Um, sorry. I do have an AK.MS, but I don't have it right in front of me. So sorry. <laughs> well, we do have a short version of this, but we couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you Google our Orbing, you know, yep. uh, GitHub code spaces, you'll find it as the second result. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Hey, thanks for the questions that came in, and thanks uh, for uh, for watching this at home. We are at time, and we have to uh, stop for now. So thank you so much for uh, for joining me here today, Vix, and help me understand how user research led to code spaces. Absolutely. It was a joy to be here. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, feel free to continue to ask them and sign up for the private preview, and I would love to continue to talk with you about it. Obviously, it's something that I'm excited about, so it's been yep. fun to share that space today. I appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Yep, absolutely. So make sure to hit up uh, Vix on uh, Twitter mm -hmm. or myself, and um, and we'll take it from there. So thank you so much, everyone, and I hope to see you again next week. Have a great week. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>